Thanks, uh, friends. Uh, let me welcome you uh, for this afternoon uh, seminar at ISAS on the domestic implications of the uh, China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor for Pakistan. The subject is quite familiar, but before I say a couple of words on that, I, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, uh, Professor Catherine Adene. Uh, she's the director of uh, Asia Research Institute at the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. Uh, while we are planning to work together, we already have the pleasure of some of our students and former colleagues uh, like Diego uh, joining us. And uh, it's uh, uh, really a special uh, privilege for us to have you here uh, because we've seen uh, how you, the center has uh, come up, or the, uh, the Asia Research Institute at the University of Nottingham has come up. And our own aspiration uh, has been uh, to make ISAS uh, link with other institutions that are working on uh, South Asia and the politics and the economics of the subcontinent uh, across the world. So we hope to see more of you here, and we hope that we can uh, initiate uh, uh, joint programs uh, in the uh, in the coming coming years. Uh, uh, Professor Catherine Adeni has uh, worked on a number of issues, for example, on the questions of uh, elections and democracy in the subcontinent, uh, the politics of majoritarian nationalism in South Asia and the politics of uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, which is, of course, uh, the subject of interest today. Uh, as you know that in this part of the world, certainly, the BRI has been the magical letters for almost uh, six years. Uh, almost everything, everyone uh, is working on or looking at or studying or uh, at the, of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Uh, and within that, of course, our friends in China and Pakistan have proclaimed the CPEC, or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, was one of the most important pivotal ones. But of course, many of the projects uh, that have been there uh, preceded uh, the uh, announcement of the BRI. Uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Cooperation is deep and uh, goes back a long time. Uh, those of you old enough to remember the Karakoram Highway, uh, which was really built in the 70s. I mean, I think it was one of the great engineering marvels uh, where the Chinese built a road on top of the Karakoram Mountains uh, into uh, Kashmir uh, on the Pakistani side. Uh, and many PLA soldiers actually died building it. Uh, the difference, of course, between the 1970s and now, while the strategic considerations were an important, were the driving force for China's uh, you know, grand uh, engineering projects, that uh, first one of which came to, came to Pakistan, uh, today, I think it's a combination of uh, economic and strategic uh, considerations. So that makes it uh, today, and the scale of the Chinese resources uh, and what they can bring to the table is far more significant. So, uh, and within that, uh, what China does in Pakistan, uh, it's my belief that uh, it's just the CPEC is just a, a metaphor for a large number of projects. Uh, whether we agree with it or not, I mean, I think it's transformative potential for Pakistan. Uh, which is Pakistan, many Pakistanis view this positively and see uh, this is really the answer to all their problems, whether it is true or not. But the scale of it uh, should not be uh, underestimated. Uh, traditionally, there's been no criticism of the Chinese projects in Pakistan, but under the CPEC, we're beginning to see some reaction, both uh, internally argued, that is, are all going to Punjab, are they going to some other place? So that is, of course, a fight within the uh, Pakistani elite, uh, who gets the, the bulk of the projects. But the other larger questions, I mean, that are being debated elsewhere, in Sri Lanka, Malaysia, various places, the efficacy, effectiveness, sustainability, those issues too uh, have, have been debated. So we really, uh, no one better than that, better than uh, Professor Adani to, to speak about it. The floor is yours, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mohan. Um, it's I'm going to wander around the room in a minute. So if I speak like this, can you hear me? Yeah? So do I need this? Are you recording? You're recording. OK, I will. Uh, just keep it in the OK, I will, I will try to uh, not to wander around too much then. Um, I was last here two years ago um, when I had the pleasure of being in the audience for one of these seminars and was really struck by how engaged everyone was and what a fantastic seminar it was. And it's an enormous privilege for me to have been invited uh, to speak here today. So thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, I would like to stress before I begin that this is a jointly authored work, um, jointly uh, kind of authored uh, 
research um, on the China-Pakistan economic corridor uh, with Dr. Filippo Boni, who is at the uh, University of Birmingham. So I cannot claim credit for everything um, I'm going to talk about um, today, although it is a, a joint work. So as said, I'm going to talk about the China-Pakistan um, economic corridor. I completely agree with you that a lot of things that were going to be happening already have been rebadged. Um, and the idea of the project as this overarching, coherent whole is something that I think gives it more coherence than it actually has um, in practice. I'm going to do a number of things um, today. I I'm going to talk about... Um, so there's Gwadar uh, Port. Um, I'm going to talk, first of all, about what we actually mean when we talk about CPEC. Um, I'm then going to talk about how is it being implemented in Pakistan. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the implications for centre-provincial relations um, and the relations between the provinces. A lot of my previous research has been on the Federation of Pakistan, and it really worries me some of the things that CPEC is now threatening to unravel um, in terms of the progress that Pakistan's made on federal harmony um, since uh, 2010. And then finally, no presentation on Pakistan will be complete without a uh, kind of talk about, is the election of Imran Khan, you know, has it changed anything in relation to CPEC? And one would expect that it would. Because a lot of what Imran Khan was talking about before the election was extremely critical of CPEC. So this is something that really uh, demands um, an assessment. So in first, my first point, what is the China-Pakistan economic corridor? The first point to make is that it's, you know, you mentioned about the BRI being really big in Southeast Asia. But CPEC in Pakistan is the project really that China is almost depending on as a, well, look how well we've done it here. You know, it is, a lot of people argue that it's simply too big to fail. You know, if, if it fails there, then it just sends a signal to the whole world that um, <clears throat> this cannot be uh, delivered. And an indication of this is the enormous sums of money that are being invested I use invested in uh, quotation marks because the funding for these uh, projects is something that has been extremely controversial, as I will talk about um, in more detail. $62 billion, an absolutely staggering amount of money is being invested um, in these projects. And we are right to question what is the motivation for China of investing such enormous sums of money. Is it economic? Is it strategic? You know, both of these things are important. As I'll talk about, it's one of the ways where you can really look and see ch where China's strategic interests lie are in those projects where it's given grants rather than loans. So things such as the port of Gowada, as I'll come and talk a bit more about, is actually a loan from the Chinese, sorry, a grant from the Chinese, rather um, than a loan. The problem with the loans, as the IMF is finding out in Pakistan at the moment, is no one really knows what the details are. We're being told they're at market rates. We don't know the exact amounts. We don't know the exact rates or the way in which they're being paid off. And if the IMF can't get these details, when Pakistan's desperate for this bailout, that tells you something about the locus of power in this relationship between the two countries. Um, what Filippo and I have done is we, um, there's so many projects that have been put under the Belt and Road Initiative um, and under CPEC. What we did was we looked at what were tasked to be the early harvest projects, you know, three, four years ago. The ones that were, you know, kind of the ones that were going to be, this is how it's going to be. And we've performed an assessment on the implementation of these projects, but also broken it down by province to see are the charges, as you alluded to, you know, about the Punjab benefiting from all of this uh, investment, true or false. So you can see there are many, many projects um, in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. 
Um, we have a lot of energy projects. This is important um, and is a sign of Pakistani influence on the project. So in the 2013 election, uh, Nawaz Sharif was um, elected. One of the big reasons he was elected was a promise to, promise to keep the lights on in Pakistan, to address the energy deficit and the shortages and the load shedding. Um, and it's, I think, quite significant that so, much, so many of these projects were focused on energy because this was not, well, China benefits from Pakistan's economy working, but this was very much a domestic imperative um, for Pakistan. But there are also a lot of um, road projects um, were identified. And it's important to note the difference between the two sides um, of, the, um, of the country. So you have down here, you have the Eastern Corridor going through the Punjab and Sindh and over to uh, Gowada there, the port in Baluchistan. And then you have the Western and more direct route um, down to Gowada. Now, at the time, and it's actually quite difficult to find details on this now, but when this was first being implemented, it was all about the Western route. This was the most direct route. It was going to be um, bought in. It was going to develop the provinces of Baluchistan and Khyber Pakhtunwa. Um, as I will discuss, this hasn't happened. It's been incredibly controversial. Um, much of the re re rhetoric about CPEC and the Belt and Road Initiative more generally has been that it's going to foster economic development and that it's going to foster economic development in parts of both countries that have been historically underdeveloped. And so you see China uh, building up uh, in Xinjiang province um, and focusing on the economic benefits um, to that province. Uh, but the idea that this would also then develop the sort of province of Gilgit Baltistan um, and the provinces of Khyber Pakhtunwa and Baluchistan was one of the things that was incredibly prominent in the rhetoric around uh, CPEC and one of the justifications for it um, at the beginning. But as I said, it's really awakened grievances because these expectations have been dashed. And even with the election of Imran Khan, not to spoil my conclusion, uh, they continue to be dashed um, in Pakistan. In 2015, uh, Senator Achakjai of the, um, I think he's from the PK map uh, party, actually re-termed it. It's not the China-Pakistan economic corridor, it's the China-Punjab economic corridor. But to say that in Pakistan, whether you were Pakistani or a foreigner such as myself, was seen to be anti-national. And those of us who work on CPEC will know that you will get followed by the uh, Deputy uh, High Commissioner for uh, China, or sorry, Deputy uh, Ambassador for China, um, if you're on Twitter to you know, see what you're saying about it. You would, regu well, I would regularly get trolled Things I would just say very innocuously, such as really hope that CPEC will lead to development in Baluchistan. Can't see anything wrong with that. Hordes of abuse for daring to question that this might be a project that's not going to benefit the whole of Pakistan um, equally. Those of you who know Pakistani politics and know the history of Baluchistan know, of course, Baluchistan has good reason to fear that it's not going to get its fair share of rewards. Something that may have everything to do with uh, Pakistani domestic politics and not so much to do with China. Again, an indication that this may, the problems here are not just um, of China's causing. To give you an idea of the headlines, so this is a kind of hyperbole that you would see in the press. You know, CPEC is a game changer. You know, CPEC, you know, Mushahid Hussein, CPEC's gonna benefit all provinces. How dare you say anything any anywise, you know, you Westerner who knows nothing about Pakistan. You know, that's the kind of diatribe um, you get. But then you have the, you know, the Pakistani criticisms as well. You know, as said, it's the China Punjab economic corridor. It's going to ignore Baluchistan. 
What about the Western route? The government is deliberately ignoring the Western route that goes through Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Baluchistan. You know, so real concerns have been raised, not just internationally, but also domestically. So Filippo and I looked at the early harvest pro projects um, in Pakistan and the CPEC website, cpec.gov.pk, um, I mean, you really need to print it out every time you look at it because stuff changes on it all the time. But at the time, you know, we, we did this research uh, back, you know, at the beginning of last year, uh, end of 2017, you know, we, we identified the early harvest projects uh, per province. And it's interesting because you can see that um, there, Sindh has the biggest number of projects. So the idea of Punjabi domination um, is not really, you know, kind of borne out um, by this. You know, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa has seven. Baluchistan's not doing so well with four, but it's not being ignored in its entirety. But you've got to go further than that because you've got to look at the implementation what's actually been delivered on the ground. And this is what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of the, the presentation to give you an idea. So if we look at transport and infrastructure projects, I've broken it down into those that have been completed or are nearly completed, those that are estimated for this year, this changes all the time, but this is the current state of play as of a couple of days ago. Those that are estimated for next year or 2021, and those that are 2022 plus, which we must cast out on are they ever going to happen? Because many of these haven't even had their agreements signed, and the Pakistani government under Imran Khan is actually rolling back on a number of these projects now. You can see that of those actual completions, nothing has happened in terms of transport uh, infrastructure. Punjab and Sindh are likely to have um, one project uh, completed. This is the Al Multan Sakur um, motorway, um, is likely to be completed this year. Um, and then you have the uh, upgrading of the uh, Karakorm Highway, um, which is expected to take place um, next year. That's the current, um, current prediction. But all the other projects, those in KP and those in uh, Baluchistan, you know, are not really happening. Those projects that are happening, they're going to be completed this year or next, are solely linked to the Eastern Corridor. They're not linked to the Western route at all, down through Baluchistan and uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, despite the fact that the Karakorm Highway bit is, is um, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. If we look at energy projects as well, you can see there is again a big difference. So you can see that 40% of Punjab's projects have already been completed. Sin's doing pretty well as well with 46% you know, of its projects uh, being completed and another four estimated to be completed next year. Um, compare that to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Baluchistan. Um, one is estimated to be completed in Baluchistan next year or this year. Um, we'll see if that happens. Um, but these two, again, have just been kind of put onto uh, the never, the never, never. So even though you've had the projects have been allocated in the CPEC plan as the early harvest, the early, you know, important projects, in terms of delivery, it's Sindh and Punjab that have benefited. Now, as said, that's interesting. It's not just Punjab that's benefiting. It's also Sindh, um, something that historically hasn't happened. But it's certainly not Khyber Pakhtunkhwa nor Baluchistan. If we move on to the third aspect of those early harvest projects, there was a separate section um, for Gawada. And you can see that one has been um, completed. Um, that is the special economic zone uh, where they're holding these Guada expositions. You know, come and invest in Guada. What a wonderful place um, to build your business. You have another two that are estimated to be completed this year. One is the smart port city. 
Um, and the other is a desalination plant, which uh, Gwadar so desperately um, needs. But all the other projects, including a university, a hospital, projects that are designed to benefit the local Baluch, nothing. And many of these projects have now actually been removed from the, um, the Pakistan kind of projected budget, the, uh, you know, the development program. If you, if you go through and uh, highlight which ones have been removed that are linked to CPEC. Interestingly, in that budget, they made it a lot harder to identify which were CPEC programs. It was, it was a bit of a turgid task. To go. I mean, in previous budgets, in previous, sorry, uh, public sector development program, you had a whole separate section on CPEC. This time it was removed. So you had to kind of, we had to tabulate uh, quite carefully. So picture tells a thousand, you know, is worth a thousand words, as it were. So if we come back to look at the major projects to get a sense of what's actually happening on the ground. If we look at energy projects, I'm kind of doing a traffic light system here. So green means that they have been completed. I think visually that tells you all you need to know about the provincial dynamics of the uh, China-Pakistan um, economic corridor. You know, they are in Sindh um, and in Punjab. Now. If we look at those that are likely to be completed um, in the next year or two, again, traffic light system, you can see that you've got one in Baluchistan. This is the um, East, Way, East Bay Expressway going from Gawada Port into Karachi. This has also been funded by a Chinese grant rather than a loan, again, indicating where China's strategic um, interest uh, lies. And you then have some other uh, power plants um, here um, as well. If we look at those of the early harvest projects that are, um, sorry, I'll go back and say that one, sorry, there. Sorry, that's not the East Bay Expressway. That's, um, is that a coal-fired plant? No. Sorry, I'm going to have to check my figures. Sorry, the one that is not expected to be completed is that's a coal-fired plant which has just again been put onto um, the never, never. Um, in contrast to the ones that are in Punjab that have been um, completed. Some of the ones up here, these are hydropower projects. So, you know, they're not going to be able to be built quickly. They are, you know, require a lot of land. They require the movement of people. So some, there's something to do with the topography of the landscape that explains this. A lot of these down here in Sindh are wind power and solar power. Again, much easier um, to build. But even so, um, it's still quite significant. If we look at the roads, you can see this is the one that's due to be completed next year, firmly in the, or this year, firmly in the eastern route. And then one that is predicted to ha take, uh, be completed by 2020, the upgrading of a section of the Karakorm um, Highway. Nothing down here. They're not even started yet. And many of them, as said, have been removed from the public um, you know, development um, program. <clears throat> one final thing I will mention, because it, I think it's very significant and I need to find someone who knows a lot more about uh, technology than, than I do to assess the significance of this. But the other thing that has been completed, and in record-breaking time, is the optical fiber cable coming from, pa coming from China into Pakistan. I'm not sure of the significance of this. But I was in Sri Lanka in um, November last year, and a lot of concerns were being raised there. And we've seen this also with Huawei um, recently and other countries as well, about Chinese use of technology. We know how Chinese, um, you know, kind of condenses and limits what its citizens can view on the internet when you're in China. The fact that this was such a prominent project and, oh, it's funded by a grant. Again, this is strategic interest. The question is why? 
and I don't have a clear answer to that and I can guess but I would like to you know I'd like to get your thoughts on that because that was completed um, very much on schedule with a grant and given what I'm hearing in Sri Lanka as well people are really concerned about Chinese um, involvement um, and control of information and access to information so what now under Imran Khan um, Imran Khan, as you know, um, has his, well, to the extent that we can say he has a base, given that he has been um, so sponsored uh, by the military um, to come to power. But his PTI were in control of Khyber Pakhtunwa province um, from the 2013 to the 2018 election, and it still maintains um, control of that province. Now, given that, and given how Khyber Pakhtunwa was excluded from power, you know, from the projects, you would expect them to have been very critical of the CPEC. And they were. Um, they were critical of the decision making process. They were critical of the, you know, the fact that they did not know who was on the joint coordination commission committee, sorry, between uh, China and Pakistan overseeing these projects. Uh, and after he comes to office, this is a um, newspaper article in the FT that caused a bit of a ruckus in Pakistan in, on September the 9th, 2018. You know, Pakistan rethinks its role in Aziz uh, Belt and Road um, plan. Remember that date, September 9th, 2018. September 10th, 2018, Prime Minister Imran renews commitment to CPEC. And then the next day, Pakistan remains committed to CPEC. It completely rejects the report on uh, BRI renegotiation. And the minister was said, I have been, you know, I have been misquoted on this. Well, I'm not quite sure how you can misquote uh, a minister. He was on that. He was pretty <coughs> definite. But there's obviously been a lot of pressure, and I would suspect it comes from two sources. One is the military in Pakistan, which I'll come to talk about in a minute, and one is directly from the Chinese, that this is just not going to fly. You know, the idea of Saudi involvement in CPEC projects was mooted around the same time. Again, that went quiet quite quickly um, as well, again, after Chinese pressure. So what's happened more recently? Even an ally of Imran Khan, the Ba'ath Party um, of Baluchistan that was uh, basically formed to um, get uh, Imran Khan a majority um, in the Senate, um, has said, well, the Western route is not part of CPEC. They have just said, look, it's being ignored. It's not going to happen. And the ministry came out and denied this. It said, no, this is absolutely going to happen. But even if your own senators and allies are saying that, they're, they're, they're worried. And Karam Hussein had a fantastic article in Dawn that if you're interested in this, I would really encourage you to read on December the 11th, when the Baluchistan cabinet had a presentation on CPEC. And they were really shocked by how little investment there had been in the province, the fact that all these, energy all these energy projects were supposed to benefit the main grid of Pakistan, so it didn't matter whether they were located in Sindh or Punjab, Baluchistan would still benefit. <coughs> well, this report stated quite clearly that Baluchistan has not benefited from the increased uh, megawatts available um, on the grid. And if we look to the JCC, the Joint Coordination uh, Committee between Pakistan and China um, that happened at the end of December last year, you can see that they've actually agreed to broaden the CPEC scope, focusing in particular on special economic zones where Chinese companies would have favorable terms and would be able to come and invest in Pakistan, but also on agriculture a subject that a lot more work needs to be done on how Pakistan's agricultural development is then going to you know, go into feeding China 
and how that's going to impact on Pakistan's domestic economy um, in the future. A lot more work needs to be done um, on this. How much longer do I have? Yeah, I have. Okay. Um, so, I mean, in conclusions, um, priority is still being given to Sindh and the Punjab. You know, despite the fact that they are the more developed provinces um, already. As said, if you look at the program of public sector works, many, many projects are now just being shelved um, completely. And this is despite the fact that the PTI is still in control in the government in Khyber Pakhtunwa. Um, the domestic politics of Pakistan and the composition of the National Assembly means that anyone who hopes to retain power in Pakistan has to control the Punjab. They have to get the support of the Punjab. And so Imran Khan is looking at the Punjab and will continue to do so, despite the fact that the PTI has also a base in Khyber Pakhtunwa. Something I want to say a little bit more about, and spend a little bit more time on, is this idea about worries about reversing the 18th Amendment. Um, this was something I did a lot of work on at the time. For those of you who don't know, the 18th Amendment was a real sea change in Pakistan, something that watchers of Pakistan's federal system did not expect to happen. It redid the distribution of resources alongside with the National Finance Commission of that year. So the provinces got more resources from the center, the provinces also, the distribution, uh, the way that the, dis the uh, finances were distributed also changed. So prior to this, the Punjab got the majority of the resources because it had the majority of the population. Interestingly, when uh, East Pakistan was part of Pakistan, uh, um, that wasn't the formula they used. Um, but they did after 1973. For the first time, you have allowances made for backwardness, you know, the need to kind of give more resources to develop a province. You have, for example, um, an allocation for the fact if you've got a number of resources, natural resources in your province, rather than these proceeds going to the centre and then being kind of redistributed down, the province would get a much greater share of these um, resources. These were really important to demands of the Baluch. At the same time, and, it, and it's notable that Baluch leaders signed up to the 18th Amendment. It was a proper cross-party uh, coalition. The other thing the 18th Amendment did was it gave a lot of powers to the provinces. So the concurrent mm -hmm. list was abolished. And you've essentially got the federal legislative list, which is the, the first tranche, which the central government controls. You've got the second tranche, which both of them can have a say on. And then you've got everything else, which now resides with the provinces. Personally, I don't think the provinces were quite ready for it in Pakistan, but that's uh, another, another story. What is now being talked about is that these gains are in danger of being reversed in Pakistan. Because if you want to provide security to the Chinese engineers that are building the East, Way, East Bay Expressway, if you want to provide uh, security for the you know, engineers working on the port, you need to have an armed force. And Pakistan has tasked such a force. But it's got to pay for it. Pakistan is not rolling in money, you know, and the increased allocation down to the provinces has left the federal government with a reduced amount of money to do this. So General Bajwa last year actually talked about rolling back the 18th Amendment to allow, you know, the federal government to have uh, more, more money. At the same time, this Joint Coordination Commission between, um, India, sorry, between China and Pakistan you would think, given that most of the things related to CPEC, such as roads, such as, you know, kind of energy, although not electricity, interestingly, were a provincial concern, you would have thought the provinces and their chief ministers would have been centre stage in the planning. That committee met for three years before any provincial chief minister of Pakistan got to go on it. 
They were only added in 2016, and this was set up in 2013. You also look at the Council of Common Interests, the one that decides on those matters on the second list, the Federal Legislative List 2, where electricity um, is placed. You can't find any mention or barely any mention of any of the CPEC projects on there either. So the provinces have just not been in this, in this space at all. It's been centrally directed. And under the civilian control, under Nawaz Sharif, they were really concerned to keep it away from the military, but they weren't keen to give it to the provinces. They wanted to keep it very much in their hands. Now we have a prime minister who is beholden to the military. That centralization is going to come home to roost um, even more and is one of the worries um, I have about going forward um, in Pakistan. And finally, of course, and in conclusion, there still remain incredible worries about the nature of the loans. A lot of people will say in Pakistan, the, the apologists for CPEC or the supporters of CPEC, and I would agree, I think this has the power to transform Pakistan. Goodness knows Pakistan needs investment. And people will say it gets this investment, its GDP is going to go up, um, its you know, economic development is going to boom, um, and it will be able to pay back these loans. But people like Haram Hussein, who is a much better economist than I am, and um, you know, I will defer to him, he raises real concerns about is this actually going to happen. You also look at the trade balance between the two countries. The idea that Pakistan's going to be support, you know, kind of exporting agricultural projects back to Pakistan, back to China, into China. The idea that that's going to offset all the goods that are coming in from China to Pakistan. Again, it's just it's just laughable. So I'm not a naysayer on CPEC. I think it certainly, you know, it, you've seen energy rates improve. You know, goodness knows building, you know, roads is a good thing and improving roads is a good thing. But there are real concerns, and that's before we even start talking about the Indian Ocean and China's presence in the Indian Ocean. Um, there are real concerns about the way in which this is centralizing Pakistan even further. And we know that when Pakistan centralizes, that also confirms the dominance of the Punjab. And on that point, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Adin. It's, uh, I think uh, what you've done this afternoon is really to throw light on an aspect of CPEC uh, that's barely debated yeah. outside Pakistan. Uh, because most of the time we're looking at, at uh, strategic consequences, the nature of the U.S.-China uh, relationship, implications for India, or more broadly, how this is going to be the trendsetter for uh, for the projects elsewhere. But there's very little uh, nuanced understanding of the Pakistan's domestic debates and the internal concerns uh, about CPEC. And I think in the last two, three years, the Dawn newspaper has given extensive coverage to a lot of things. So there is a genuine debate uh, that is at the level of uh, academic and economic analysis. Uh, there has also been a genuine debate between politicians. They're always the first ones to uh, point to problems in South Asia. But we've seen uh, very little outside understanding of this. And thank you for, for uh, doing that today. And I think it's also the, uh, your work on fed federations, your work on federalism, uh, the impact of uh, the, uh, I think I didn't know this about the, the impact of CPEC projects on 18th Amendment and the, one of the major achievements of the Zardari government was really to, to be able to uh, great, give great decentralization to the extent what was a single unitary kind of net structure. Maybe it's only achievement. Yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> so which is, uh, which again I think is not fully understood. So I think many of us tend to uh, simplify and monochromatize the Pakistani politics. It's all about, you know, just a you know, single objective, but we really rarely go into the, the, the texture and the nuances of what's going on inside Pakistan. So I think it's been a very uh, illuminating exercise. Now, before I open up to the floor, I just wanted to one one thing. I think you mentioned the optical fiber cable. Yeah. Uh, it's really, I think uh, there's something, I mean, I think uh, we've just started looking at it here. We have, I'm sure one of my colleagues will send you a printout, the copy of uh, what is being called the digital Silk Road uh, as a complement of probably what is far more consequential over the longer term uh, beyond the physical infrastructure that the China is doing under CPEC and the I mean, in the uh, BRI elsewhere, the idea of a digital Silk Road, the term itself, I think, is only in the last two years 
Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, I think at the end of 2017, I mean, started using this term. But I think there is a, a, an integration, for example, the optical fiber network you talked about. So eventually what I think the Chinese strategy, for right or wrong, we don't have to pass judgments, I'm not passing judgments at this time. It's really about, today the internet flows into Pakistan or India, or much of the subcontinent comes through optical fibers, they generally say controlled by the West or owned by the West. So what China is doing is really to be able to redirect the traffic to Chinese-owned or Chinese-controlled channels. Uh, there's a similar fi link is being built to Nepal, uh, and a whole lot of things have happened in Southeast Asia. Uh, there is also, if you map, uh, there is reports at least of an uh, optical fiber link from uh, Karachi to into the Gulf. So there are a lot of, so it's basically one, the connectivity of internet flows, of communication flows, and then, you know, the GCHQ in London, what it does, I mean, you tap on the key nodes, and the nodes, I think that's what the redirection, and, or through a new infrastructure of uh, optical fiber, something similar has happened in the Pacific, uh, South Pacific, Australians stepped in to stop uh, China from building a new, uh, you know, link to Solomon Islands. So I think all kinds of, you know, but it's, there is a beginning of a discourse on digital Silk Road. And if you map next week, or the satellite stations in Pakistan, maybe you'll get a, you know, additional input into this picture. Uh, across the region, the same as part of the BRI, Chinese are setting up satellite stations which receive signals, intelligence, I mean, a whole lot of things. They're civil, military, uh, and then they're linked to space assets that China has. And China-Pakistan space cooperation, again, is a pretty pretty old one. So if you add the space part, the integration of the, uh, the, the internet and the cyber systems, I think you'll see a far more uh, interesting uh, picture, I think. But this is going to be the trend, I would say, uh, and that, that leads you to the bigger fight the Chinese are having on 5G with the, with the Americans. So I think uh, the digital Silk Road, a uh, lot of research uh, is possible. And one of my colleagues did a short piece, so we can send you that. I mean, it's really very preliminary, a uh, very simple thing. So I'll stop there, and uh, please uh, introduce yourself, and uh, you can make some comments. Sir. So. Uh, um, my question is, I had two questions. Uh, at a high, high level, if you could, your slide showed the $62 billion, the total um, CPEC, 60% of that uh, in the state of Punjab. At a high level, if you could just because your slides didn't say it, break that down. And particularly, if you look at the IMF bailout, was about a fifth or a sixth of that um, with terms and conditions. If you could break that down, roughly. And the second question is the pre-Imran pre Khan, pre-Nawaz uh, Sharif, the Zardari regime. So the role of the PPP and how many projects came into Sindh during uh, Mr. 10% or Mr. Zardari, whatever you call him, during his innings. country and the subject. Now, uh, my uh, uh, question uh, is with regard to the last point you made in your substantive remarks on agriculture. Now, one of the stated goals of CPEC was uh, focus on the untapped potential, agricultural potentials of Pakistan. Now, this could create some problems uh, in the provinces that have profited most from CPAC, that is uh, uh, Sindh and Punjab rather than Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan, because uh, there is no clarity about the agricultural component of CPAC's policies, for starters. And, and uh, 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 agricultural land holdings in uh, Sindh and Punjab are privately owned. Uh, so they are not familiar with the Chinese methodology, and apparently this has sparked uh, problems in Central Asia. So they, there is a potential red flag with regard to agriculture in Sindh and Punjab, the provinces that are slated to benefit most from CPEC. Am I right in supposing that? Okay, one more. Is anyone? Uh, Sylvia. Yes, sir. Thanks, for Professor, for this very stimulating presentation. Uh, just a quick question on, on method, if you want. I was just, as you said at the beginning, lack of transparency from the donors, but also the recipient side, is one of the main issues for researchability of this kind of issues. So I was wondering, how did you go about that? And especially, how did you manage to calculate the percentages on completed projects? So if data are incomplete, so did you contrast the number of completed projects 
vis-a-vis -vis the total number of projects, or you used some estimation? Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, three fantastic questions. Um, I can't answer all of them without kind of going back and looking at my data set, so we might have to talk a little bit more um, informally later when I can get my computer open. Um, if we, if I take your question first, um, so the CPEC website, uh, like I said, cpec.gov.pk, um, had the list of the early harvest projects. Um, it had how much money was allocated to them. It had its um, prospective time scale. Um, it updates these periodically. So we're going by the official um, government statements on what has been, um, you know, what, what they're predicting. Now, often they miss their predictions. And, you know, that could be something that we would um, include as well. So things that they say will be completed by 2018. If you read the, you know, the press and, you know, it's not likely to be completed until 21 or 22 or perhaps never. But that's how we've done it, is we, we've done it using uh, government statistics. Um, and the fact, yes, some of this may be massaged slightly, but, you know, you, you can also kind of go and then you look at this with regards to newspaper reports as well and, um, you know, see, have these actually uh, been put together? Things like the salination plant in um, Baluchistan, for example. So it's worth looking at, but it changes so often. So, and then you, you don't get an idea of what's changing. So if you're researching this, you need to print out everything. And then you can kind of literally go back and compare the hard copies, because I've torn my hair out on this several, um, several times. Um, it's really unclear what's going to happen with agriculture. Um, will there be incentives provided? Um, in which case that could potentially get round some of these um, issues. Um, much of this land will be owned by, you know, kind of former army people or army families. Um, I'm pretty sure they're going to make sure that um, their own interests are not um, hurt um, by this. One of the things that has been said is that they're worried about what crops are going to be grown on it, whether if they move towards more of a kind of a rice based production, um, that is then going to skew, you know, the food that is available for Pakistan. The point is, we just don't know yet. And the Chinese themselves um, complained at the Joint Coordination com you know, Committee in, in December that they just didn't have enough information because Pakistan hadn't provided it. Um, as a Chinese said, they just a Chinese official said they just hadn't done their homework, you know. So it's it's incredibly difficult to um, to to know what's going to happen. But yes, this could potentially. Um, I think your question on uh, whether Zadari had a hand in um, these is a good one. The answer is I don't know, but I will go and look. I suspect that a lot of these are of more recent origin. But what's been happening um, is that the PPP government, um, the local, go you know, the provincial government was lobbying very heavily to get a lot of the projects um, included. Um, so it could be that these were previous projects that were promised by the PPP and then they've now lobbied to, to get them um, included under the uh, CPEC plan. Um, the fact though that they have been included is significant, but it may speak less to kind of like accommodation of Sin's provincial autonomy than it has to do with uh, Sharif's desire to just get the keep the lights on. So if they are, even though they're based in Sind, it still benefits him um, overall. And if you look at the opinion polls um, from the province um, just before the election, they did quite well on uh, energy generation um, in in the Punjab because obviously it goes into the grid. Um, when you say a breakdown, what kind of breakdown are you looking just, for? Just a high level. So, so for example, so 60% is clear, 60% that money is from Jan. Uh, and I was, because I remember a few months ago, there was a discussion. He was looking at about $12.5 billion from the IMF. And mm -hmm. they came with a 10-point checklist to say, you'll get this twelve and a half or $13 billion if you check all 10, mm -hmm. 10, 10 boxes. We went to Saudi Arabia, and the figure was $14 or $15 billion with a maybe 30 point check, because I don't know the details there. But the Chinese negotiations were a few weeks later, don't mm -hmm. know the figure, don't know what was discussed. Uh, and obviously that was factored into the 62 <coughs> billion war chest in total. So just a very high level.
level math because some of the math in your slides wasn't there unless you don't know it's okay. I don't know off the top of my head, but I've got it on my laptop, so I can let's talk afterwards and I, I can show you. But I don't, I'm not an economist and I, I don't have these numbers in my head, I'm afraid. But I just wanted to add something here, I mean, yeah. which is, uh, you, know, Kar you know, Karachi uh, and Sindh has generally been the traditional, more industrialized area. I mean, I think while the, there is a bias in regional distribution, I mean, you still have to go by the logic uh, of where the industry is. So, some of it could be due to that. Uh, the other is the uh, the transport projects. In the end, they have to come to the Arabian Sea coast, right? So while we, everyone talks about Gwadar, I mean, I think Karachi is already a, an established port to some extent. I mean, there is a logic of you know you can't just uh, develop only Punjab. So in, to the extent you have to take it down to the south, so some of the transport projects could be could be linked to that, which is. So I'm just merely uh, speculating uh, yeah, on so the basis. I mean, the yeah. stuff that's happened in Sindh is not generally transport related, yeah, with yeah. the exception of the Multan Highway. Yeah, so, yeah. so that bit is linking up Sindh and Punjab, but that's the only way they've benefited transport-wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been these wind farms and uh, the Thar coal, f coal field, of course. So that's, again, yeah. it's, it's built on that and it's developed that. So that's multiple projects are located around that one coal field. So that also explains <coughs> partly why Sindh is doing so well. But they haven't done the same kind of you know, development in Baluchistan, despite the fact that they've got coal-fired power stations scheduled to be built there. And that leads back to security, potentially, um, which is, again, something I didn't have time to talk about. But let's talk afterwards about your first point. Yeah, yeah sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm um, just a business person. Um, interest is uh, origins are from Pakistan as well. Uh, thank you very much for that, Professor. Uh, there are so many things you have said in there, so much uh, we'd like to talk about. Uh, 18th Amendment, yeah. uh, that was very enlightening on uh, the distribution of wealth among the provinces. Uh, Zardari did it. Uh, but it will be interesting to find what Zardari spent in Sindh in the last 10 years. Zero projects that would really benefit the people. Uh, you know, the only thing that really worked for the people were the NGOs who really made things happen. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why they want to go back to the center. Um, Western and Eastern corridors. Uh, a lot of the Western corridor is connection of existing roads, existing motorways which are there. So you will see the uh, development over there. Eastern corridor is, a lot of it will be totally new. Okay, And like uh, 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 Professor Mohan pointed out, that industries are in Punjab, ports are in Sindh, existing ports. So where do you develop first? Areas where uh, you can uh, you know, service first. Uh, also, the 60% uh, number uh, that's given to Punjab. Punjab has a population of 73%. So a Punjabi can say, uh, that's lost the census. OK, we can look into that, right? Well, the so, census said it was just over yeah. 50%. Um, and then uh, we come to the uh, energy projects. Uh, energy projects, um, particularly the hydropower projects, uh, one of the issues are, is that uh, during the Nawaz Sharif uh, time, there were a lot of projects which were uh, kind of airmarked and uh, um, kind of sanctioned or things like that. Uh, but the grid isn't there for the electricity, the grid to distribute it. So I think that's one of the uh, problems why some of these projects are uh, being delayed. Um, IMF does not know the term loans that China gave. Like Imran Khan said, Pakistan knows, China knows, rest of the world doesn't matter, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, on a business, in our business too, That's information, the that is the point. <laughs> information, that is information the point. is on a need to know basis. That is the there point. are many people in a business who want to need, info need to know information. You know, they want to s uh, have the information, but they don't need to have that information because it's not a uh, part of their thing. If I'm lending you uh, money, then I would want to right. know <laughs> where you bought. That is the point. Uh, well, if IMF is lending, yes, but here the Chinese are lending. And 62 billion by the Chinese compared to 1 trillion spent by the US in the region, you know, on what? Uh, I guess 62 billion should be welcome any time. And lastly, uh, I think uh, with all the network that is growing, it is time for India to join in and be positive, get connected, and get the region to go ahead. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's a very positive thing that if, if all the parties, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, they get together and let it be East. 
let the West take care of West. Thank you. We'll debate that another day about India, but today it's all Pakistan. So, yes, keep up. No, no, no. Um, I, if I could, um, and yes, the census, the census recently showed that numbers have changed. So Punjab is not that dominant population-wise. But uh, I, I was curious if I could um, ask you to speak a little more on Gilgit and Balistan, okay. because with this 18th Amendment issue, I've been trying to think this, some of these issues through, and which I hope to get an answer from you. Um, on one hand, we have this centralization. This, this threat of centralization going on um, that kind of um, counters the 18th Amendment issue. But on the other hand, Gilgit Balistan is in a very unique position now because to provide this security, their efforts to kind of revamp it into a distinct administrative province of its own, which then has implications on Pakistan's claim on Kashmir yeah. and then implications on Pakistan India relations. So, what's any thoughts about? what's going on in Gilgit, Balistan in, in that sense. And I, I look forward to the conversation on the fiber optic cable as well, but I think that's for later. So just to add to that, uh, what does it do to Pakistan's own claimed sovereignty or spaces uh, which are you know, on the border, with, on the periphery with China? We'll take another question. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Benjamin. I'm a student with NUS. Um, my question is a very simple one. I just want to seek some clarification on why do you think that uh, a lot of the CPEC projects are happening in the East rather than the West? Is it more of a domestic uh, pressure? I think you briefly mentioned about the military. Uh, if so, what are their vested interests? And if it's pressure from China, is, what's their vested interest again? Is it more strategic or is it more economic? Thank you. Yeah, we have three. Yeah, so again, uh, three fantastic uh, questions. In terms of why they chose the um, Western route over the Eastern route, um, that was primarily Chinese pressure. Um, the Chinese wanted to do it quickly. They wanted roads that were already in existence, um, as you said. That was, that was exactly um, what, what was going on there. Um, my point in mentioning it and talking about it is that it goes directly counter to the narrative that was used to sell CPEC, CPEC to the Pakistan people. Um, at the time, people were talking about it um, and saying what a great thing this was going to be. And the reason the Western route was um, proposed is because if you look at the map, it's a lot more direct. So not only would building these roads lead to a, um, a gain for the communities of Khyber Pakhtunwa and Baluchistan, um, and Baluchistan in especially has been underdeveloped, not just undeveloped, it, it's been underdeveloped by the Pakistani state since independence. Um, doesn't matter that only 4% of the population live there, it has been underdeveloped and people are really excluded. They don't have schools, they don't have access to water. Um, so by building that road, you would have benefited those provinces. It would have been quicker to get down there. And it was sold to the pa people of Pakistan um, to do that. But it was, it was Chinese pressure. Um, they went for the existing, um, the existing whim. The point about the grid not being there to distribute the, kind of the gains from hydropower, one of the projects that has been um, culled has been upgraded, the upgrading the transmission network. They're not doing it. It's one of the things that they're saying we're not, we're not going to fund um, anymore. I don't, I mean, if you're going to the IMF for a bailout, I completely agree with what you say. If you're, if the IMF is going to be lending to Pakistan, it doesn't want to be lending to Pakistan so Pakistan can pay back Chinese loans. Um, and I think that's a very valid point um, of the IMF. And it's not just the IMF. People are raising real concerns in Pakistan. Has Pakistan got the ability to pay this back? Is it going to end up in a situation like Sri Lanka had, where Hambon Tota port is now a 99-year lease to the Chinese? We've seen it happen. It, this is not fictional. This could happen at some point in the future. This has happened in South Asia already. So I think Pakistan is, is, is very, very worried um, about that. Gilgit Baltistan is really interesting. Um, there have been moves um, 
And this was around the time of the 18th Amendment to you know, talk about whether this would be made into a province, the fifth province of Pakistan. Those of you who know my work know that I think Pakistan should have many more than four provinces and this would be very, very good for Pakistan's uh, federal stability to divide the Punjab, have more of a coalition of, of interests. Interestingly, Imran Khan committed himself to divide the Punjab in the last election um, to create you know, the province of Bahawalpur. Um, silence, just saying, you know. Um, but they haven't. They haven't gone down the route of making it a fully fledged province of Pakistan, and that's specifically because of um, if they if they do that, then you run the risk of uh, you know kind of accepting the international line of control um, with um, India. One of the things that I've speculated about, um, and people in Pakistan tell me they think it's too soon for now, but it may happen, is whether. China will put pressure on Pakistan to accept the LOC precisely because it wants to have that stability in the region and whether then China could actually be a force for good in you know, kind of creating stable relations between India and Pakistan. Um, it's probably too soon is what I'm told but I think that there is potential for that especially if they want to get India into the BRI. Um, that might be the, the quid pro quo. There's been a lot of centralization going on even in Gilgit Baltistan though. So in May last year they centralized the power um, under the Prime Minister again and they weren't very happy about that in Gilgit Baltistan and no one's really talking about that. But suddenly the Prime Minister took back all the powers. So they've still got their assembly but there's been a downgrading um, of, of the autonomy. Um, and your question, I mean, I think it was Chinese pressure that they wanted to work with existing infrastructure because it was quicker. They haven't wanted any delays to the project. Um, so when the planning minister, Asan Iqbal, was removed from post, they put pressure on Pakistan's government to put him back in again because they thought he was doing a good job. He was only out of his, that office for a month. Um, I think, I think it's, um, that part is economic. Um, I think the focus on the Gwadar port is very strategic. I think it opens up China you know, to a whole, not only does it give it security in its energy supplies because it doesn't have to go through the Straits of Malacca in the South China Sea, um, but it also gives it access to the Indian Ocean region, something that India is extremely concerned about and uh, you know, Professor Mohan knows a lot more about than, than I do. But it was Chinese pressure that did that. Okay, we go for the next round, probably. Yeah. Chaha, if you want to do uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I can't say I know too much about the CPEC in, in general, but I just want uh, to know your viewpoint on this uh, optic fiber cable. Mm. Uh, I, I just did a search on Google and uh, randomly I just saw that there was this project called the Pakistan East Africa Cable Express which is actually a sort of a domestic pro project whereby Huawei Marine mm -hmm. from China actually planned plan to invest in it uh, last year, April. And then by October, they actually started manufacturing this, uh, these cables. So uh, where does it run from? Where to where? Uh, it, it attempts to run from, uh, from Pakistan through Kenya to Djibouti. Yeah. 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 And via submarine cable through sub some sort of submarine project. Uh, I just want to um, know, are there other signs that uh, China may be using Pakistan to bridge uh, connectivity with the African region as a whole. Yeah. So, I mean, no, I'll, we'll come to uh, Dipinda. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could briefly turn to the other side of the coin, and that's the financing of uh, CPEC as well as BRI broadly. Um, most private, purely private sector entities in, in China don't want to touch a number of these projects with a barge pole. Uh, the only entities that are involved are quasi-state-owned. Could you talk about some of the debates that are going on within China? And you do get occasional peaks from the FT and about dissenting voices. Uh, it's not a bottomless pit, and besides, after the fiasco at Hamban Tota and a couple of others, I imagine the risk premium on financing also has been going up steadily. Thank you. 
Yes, yeah, you, yeah. you just introduce yourself. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mohamed Sanan from RSIS. Um, just a brief question on security because, um, you know, we had the attack on the Chinese consulate some time back and there have been at least a lot of analysts from Pakistan do say that incidents are not reported within the Pakistani press regarding attacks taking place in the Balochistan region. Uh, you also have the entry of Chinese military contractors now coming into Pakistan, like private military contractors, right? And um, and then you have the Xinjiang issue and, you know, people actually like rallying up around that. So what sort of implications? Uh, and, and, and just connected to this is the fact that at some point, some people started blaming India for the BLA attack as well. Right. Um, what sort of implications uh, come on security, uh, very specifically uh, with with regards to the CPEC and especially in the Balochistan region? Right. Thanks. Um, I think you know more about the Pakistan Kenya Djibouti <laughs> connection than I do from um, what you've done um, looked at with Google. Um, I think it may well be uh, using using Pakistan uh, for that. It sees Pakistan as a route. Um, that, that, that much is clear. Um, but I would also suggest that there might be more domestic reasons in terms of, as you said, about controlling the flow of information. Um, you know, they've been very concerned about the anti-Chinese narrative um, in Pakistan and, you know, if they can <coughs> control, control that. Um, there's also concerns about surveillance as well. And that was one of the things that was said to me very strongly when I was in Sri Lanka. They've built this lotus tower in, in Colombo and you know people I was talking to there said well God knows what they've installed in it no one knows and they're really really worried about it and I thought at the time well maybe this is you know kind of an anti-Chinese tirade and since then the we've South Asian conspiracy <laughs> tendency to well I wouldn't go that far but, um, <laughs> but since then we've had all these allegations about Huawei and you know I think I think they are right to be concerned and as said they did a grant for this the only things they've done grants for have been the East Bay, Bay Expressway, Gwadar Port itself, so we're not going to end up with Hamman Tota in Gwadar because it's a grant, um, and the fibre optic cable. All the others are done by loans. Now, some of these are concessional loans. Some of these are loans that are at market rates, allegedly. Um, most of them, the ones that the information is available for, although you can't get the details of the loans, they're state enterprises. It's basically the Chinese government um, in, another, in another name. Um, the question is, yes, they are worried about investing in Pakistan, um, and that's one of the reasons why some of the rates of return are so, so high, you know, because it's, it's the premium. But I've heard it, you know, people saying, well, they're not expecting to get all their money back. This is a wider strategic project and they can't afford to let it fail. You know, if it fails in Pakistan, what does that do for Chinese image around the world? What does it do for the Belt and Road Initiative more generally? But if you look at the joint, I mean, committee meeting, I mean, China is being quite, being a lot more explicit publicly now about, you know, Pakistan just can't come to China and say, please, and then China will give. So there is signs. I mean, Imran Khan went to say, will you give us that bailout? Didn't get it. The JCC meeting in December, you know, Imran Khan said, I've secured all this stuff. And you look at what they said, and they're very, very critical of Pakistan, you know, with regards to agriculture. Um, which again is interesting given how important this is uh, to the Chinese that they are saying that so publicly. Um, was there any other? Yeah. On the what, yeah, yeah. Oh, the security. Yeah, no one really knows what goes on in, in Baluchistan because there has just been such a crackdown on media there. Um, and, you know, it's just incredibly difficult to independently verify um, a lot of these things. India is always going to be the whipping boy. I mean, they, they had that in the um, elections. You know, it was like, oh, no, well, this is India trying to disrupt um, the, the campaign. Um, you know. I think the biggest threat of CPEC is just the fact that it's, well, maybe 
they don't need to be empowered any more than they are the military in, in Pakistan. But like I said, it just they're centralising more. It's you've got the military, you've got this force that's being funded. You know the dangers to provincial autonomy from that. With General Bajwa saying, well, we need to roll back because we need to have more central control, reading army control. Um, that's where I think I think the real the real danger is. But what's happening in Xinjiang is having a direct influence on Gilgit Baltistan because a lot of the traders from Gilgit Baltistan are married to women in Xinjiang who are now in the camps. And at 10% of the population of Xinjiang, by an estimate I heard recently, is in those camps. You know, so there's definite linkages. So is the one way of judging the way of the political merit of the projects is by, is it a loan project or is it by grant? I mean, does that give you a, some sense of initially you can separate out the purpose of the projects? I, it certainly gives you a sense of the ones that China are interested in. really wants to see succeed. Yeah. And, you know, Guadar port, um, you know, has been, has been built and, uh, you know, you know, not necessarily anyone's going there, but it's it's been built. Um, the East Bay Expressway is coming along nicely, and a fiber optic cable has been. Yeah. So follow yeah. the money, you see. Follow the money, yeah, yeah and that, that's not too. you know. I mean, that's what you know. Karam Hussein said at a <laughs> conference we held in Lahore recently, and he's he's right. Okay, Surya. Um, Surya from RSIS, and earlier with ISAS. I just wanted to clarify a point that although Pakistan has blamed India for the attack on the Consulate General of Chinese uh, in Karachi, the Chinese government itself has categorically said it was carried out by terrorists of Pakistan. That's just a clarification. But I'm curious to know how is this funding for the security force for the protection of the Chinese installations and Chinese personnel is being done. And uh, you know, have you heard anything about Pakistani complaints about Chinese military presence with regard to CPEC? Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, otherwise, yeah. yes, sir, please, just introduce yourself. Um, hi, my name is Amim. I'm from the Middle East Institute. Uh, my question is about um, some of the loans that were recently awarded by Saudi Arabia that seem to be in relationship to the same project and it seems like it's sort of diversifying and if it is, then is it just a kind of, the, the grants are roundabout, like you take money from one, you pay the other, you take money from one and then you pay the other. And if it is, then you stretch it long enough, then you don't have to pay anyone off. Wow. <laughs> a pyramid scheme. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? We can take one more and then we'll, otherwise we'll bring this to her. Chulani, you wanted to say something on Sri Lanka, China, or is there any relation to this? Or, yeah, just we'll take this one. And then. Yeah. Um, I want to know, like, how do you compare, like, you, I hear a lot of, I heard a lot of reference between Hamban Tota and uh, Gwada Port, but uh, categorically one thing is, uh, as you said, they are different loans and grants for, for, for the start. And the second thing is, uh, with regard to Hamban Tota, it is invested by the same company that is running by the Colombo, uh, running the Colombo Southern Terminal. Yeah. And um, statistically, there is improvement so far. So I want to know how do you compare this with the Gwada port in your research continuously? What do you mean by compare? In what sense? I mean, like when you said that, um, I mean uh, that uh, Guada will be taken over by Chinese the same okay. way that the Hamban Tota is being taken over. And one more clarification: if you look into the details of the uh, agreement with the Chinese, it's 99 years. Does not uh, will not be completely 99 years. Okay. There is a way of categorically changing the shares over the period of time. Yeah. This may be the last and we also want to make any final comments as well. So we can just um, how is it being funded? There's there's a separate budget line um, for this, and but they're they're finding it difficult to do so, and that's one of the reasons why they're talking about well the provinces are just getting too much money, 
um, and we need to take some money back from the provinces. Um, so they were talking initially about reducing the share of the divisible pool, um, which then goes to the provinces. But the 18th Amendment put in a lovely line that said, you cannot reduce the share of the provinces. Um, oh, you know, and it's a great line, and, but they're regretting it now. Um, well, the centre is regretting it now. I haven't heard any complaints about the security uh, forces um, myself. Um, I think people accept that you know there are real security threats um, to the CPEC projects. Um, people question the questioning I've heard is people saying, "Well, how can you stop these attacks? You know, they, they, they are going to happen." Now they've been few and far between, but if anyone's determined enough, then as we see with the embassy. Um, attack uh, last when was it? No, set, uh, October, November. You know it can happen. Um, the Saudi involvement's interesting because in September last year they said, well, yeah, Saudis are going to be able to invest in the CPEC projects, um, and I agree. It was like, well, let's take money and then you know. Um, and then the Chinese got very upset <coughs> about that, and they said, oh no, no, the Saudis aren't now allowed to invest in the in in the project so they had to roll back and then a few weeks later there was another statement that said oh no now the Chinese have agreed that the Saudis can invest in the projects I haven't heard anything subsequently so I'm not quite sure whether any money is actually being um, invested in this um, but I mean Pakistan I mean, can't exactly do a runner I mean you know it's, it's creditors are going to come at some point but Maybe the calculation is we get the investment in, we defer, we defer, and we build up the economy in the meantime. Um, and once a lot of the heavy kind of infrastructure isn't being imported into Pakistan, that's also going to help the balance of payments um, as well. Um, so that the that will go down. Um, I mean, China is running the port in Gwadar. But because it's a grant, it's not going to, um, you know, you're not going to have the same situation um, as Sri Lanka. The parallels with Sri Lanka, though, are just as they're building a special economic zone around Hambantota, that's exactly what they're doing in Gwadar um, as well. Um, and they want to, they've got all these expositions on... Um, you know what, what what's happening there and trying to get people to invest there's wonderful YouTube videos out there um, kind of talking about the merits of um, investing um, not narrated by Pakistanis I might add in the most case um, it's they're, they're very wonderful propaganda um, as we you know we were talking about um, you know in Sri Lanka in, in November there's lots of people you know who were displaced by the kind of extension of Gwadar port um, and they were promised, you know, these were fishing people and they were promised relocation. Um, that's another of the projects that's now been scrapped. Mm -hmm. You know, so people's livelihoods have been, have been removed by this. Um, people, you know, none of this is going to help the security situation in Baluchistan one jot. You know, all the potential projects that could have contributed to the Baluch local economy you know, whether it's a hospital or the training centre, again, all scrapped. Um, now, I'm not saying this is China, and that, that's one of the, um, I think, the message I'd like to end on. I have real concerns about CPEC and Pakistan's ability to pay it off. There are security concerns, um, obviously. But some of this is a Pakistani state doing what it's always done and just ignoring, you know, the Baluch and you see, you know, chickens, they're not coming home to roost. They have been roosting since, you know, the 1960s, you know, um, perhaps even before then with this low-lying insurgency um, in, in the province. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, this is all Indian engineered. It's, it's, it's quite, it's not. You know, they're not trying to incorporate um, the Baluch in any meaningful fashion. So. Like this has been in India also blame... Uh, Pakistan for everything that goes wrong. So I mean that's partly the way elites operate. So so I don't think we should give too much weight to that. But I think what's come out today, I think what's far more important, I think, is to look beyond the grand strategic arguments mm -hmm. uh, to see uh, what's happening on the ground and how the politics uh, of the project are playing out. 
because I mean, much of the work is very macro and very little is the one inside Pakistan. And I think that's, that's quite critical because the, there is an initial framework in which because Pakistan fears India, if you will, uh, or is afraid of India, wants to balance India. I mean, I'm not going into the merits of that case. But if that is the overriding logic, so there is an a priori permissiveness to what China has done in Pakistan. Uh, because Pakistan sees China as a partner to, to, to deal with its security condition. And Pakistan, China has, of course, reciprocated, giving nuclear weapons, missiles, which normally no country does. So there is a special context, a strategic context in which a lot of the initial activity has come. Uh, so, and that's the reason why it has been celebrated as the grand liberator of Pakistan from all its uh, problems. But then what you highlighted is that there are issues for the people. There are issues. Are different sections of the political elite and what the commerce minister, I mean, I think he's a businessman, is essentially saying, look, where is my share? Right? I mean, what, what happens to the local uh, money? I mean, is it all ex Chinese capital is going to run away with everything or the local capital doesn't get any projects? So I think that's a, a reasonable argument whether, you know, denying things is, of course, normal in uh, everywhere. But the real thing is that there is concern in the, in the Pakistani capital for what is worth, I mean, that they wait irrespective of how big they are, that they have concerns, the politicians have concerns. So in the end, I think it's really the, as good old Maoist age goes, I mean, finally it's politics that prevails. Uh, that the politics, like for example, if you go back to the 80s, uh, the infrastructure development in Balochistan, for example, was actually initially done by the Americans. If you go back to the American funding, in fact, there is a fabulous book uh, by Isfahani, Farnaz Isfahani, where actually you saw the roads and rivals, it is called, if I remember right, that actually you had, as part of the confrontation with Russia, Soviet Russia in, in Afghanistan, that the US would actually develop the, the west of Indus, because that's where the, the bases were, that's where you're going to project power into, uh, into, 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 uh, into Afghanistan. So, but it was a failure. In the end, nothing came of it because for the Americans, it was about strategy uh, and that it was never a sustainable enterprise and therefore you ended up actually not doing very much. And similarly, just as from the 50s, um, the Pakistanis loved the Americans, uh, then you see today no country is uh, hated more in Pakistan than, than the United States. So if the logic, if the, if the internal logic plays itself out, uh, we don't know where this might go. And I think that's what makes the study of Pakistan, irrespective of larger judgments on CPEC, that there is a co there is a case here to study how the political class, how the economic class, how the people are watching CPEC and what are the kind of reactions uh, and, and, and what it does. So I think for that, I think what we've done today, I think is fabulous and hope we can now uh, do, you know, in the days ahead, we could work together. Uh, we have a couple of projects that we're doing with Nextdoor Institute of Southeast Asian Studies of actually looking at the BRI projects, comparing uh, one in Malaysia and one in India, one in Sri Lanka, uh, Hambantota. Hambantota, of course, is the, for Chulani has to keep, you know, explaining it, but it's really become the benchmark for the discourse. I mean, is it right or wrong? It has become the symbol of, <coughs> emblematic of the problems. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, one port in Malaysia, one port in, in Sri Lanka, see, look, are there any issues for comparison? So that's one thing uh, we, we hope to do. So, so I think there are a lot of possibilities beyond the macro, and, and I think that's where uh, enormous academic work, I think, is possible. Before I conclude, and before I thank you, I just wanted to give two pieces we got done on relating to the digital Silk Road, so you could you could take a take a look at it. But this again is something. If you have colleagues working on this more complex, less understood digital Silk Road, uh, we'll be happy to uh, look at see whether there's something we can do and bring in the expertise that you might have in in, in UK to to look at that. So let me stop here and thank you very much and uh, ask all of you please uh, uh, join me in uh, thanking Professor. Thank you very much for all your fabulous questions. Um, one of the things my institute does is we run a, a blog called uh, Asia Dialogue, www.theasiadialogue.com. Uh, um, we have a special edition next week on the BRI, um, including mm. Filippo and I have written one on CPEC. So if you're interested, check it out. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah.